Welcome to Motivated to Lead Podcast, helping you become a better leader. I'm your host, Mark Klingsheim. Hi, everyone. Mark Klingsheim with SEMA Partners. Glad you could join us for our podcast this week. Uh, each week, we interview a leader, and uh, this week, we're going to be talking with Jeannie James, who is a leader in the area of healthcare, has been recognized as an expert in trends in healthcare. Uh, she's led organizations, has been a part of large healthcare systems as well as physician organizations, and has worked with uh, numerous private equity firms as well as venture capital firms. Uh, she is the, an author of six books and uh, has been recognized by Team Health as one of the 12 rising uh, women leaders in healthcare and has received numerous awards. Uh, she's going to be talking to us uh, today about how stress can affect us uh, personally, but also can impact our career and uh, some tips on how to manage stress and reduce it in our lives. And uh, she's also gonna be talking about some of the advancements in virtual reality as being used as a treatment for many conditions. Look forward to our conversation with Jeannie today as she shares some of her thoughts. Well, it's great to have each one of you join us this week for our podcast. We're glad to have Jeannie James uh, join us. And uh, Jeannie, can you first off give us just a little bit of your background and your career? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm delighted to be part of this today, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, my background is clinically I'm trained in adult neurological sciences with an emphasis on cognitive repatterning. So I practiced um, a couple of decades ago working with head trauma and stroke patients okay. and really rewiring the neural circuitry that had been damaged through stroke or head trauma by using right brain uh, therapies such as dance, Panama music, to rewire left brain functions, memory, uh, thinking logically, writing and speaking. However, for the last 20 plus years, I've been in the business side of healthcare, uh, focused primarily in startups and turnarounds. For instance, I've managed 91 hospitals for quorum health resources and launched the Community Health Task Force which was a precursor to value-based purchasing. Did a turnaround for American Home Patient was a, a DME, durable medical equipment and respiratory company. I was over 51 emergency rooms for Team Health. I was CEO of an optimal aging medical center for close to 10 years, where we looked at how to keep you young and vibrant and smart and healthy for as long as you live. Um, and I'm currently CEO and president of GJ Enterprises, which is a consulting firm focused primarily in behavioral health at this time, uh, working in startups and turnarounds, uh, delightedly working with a company that Senator Bill Frist has just co-founded. Mm. Yeah, we want to talk uh, about that. We'll talk about that a uh, little bit. But I, I guess you've done a lot of work around uh, stress and how that it, it can hijack uh, your career and uh, your life. And uh, be interesting to get some of your thoughts and, and some of the, uh, the studies that you've uh, looked at around sure. that area. Sure. You know, stress is a reality for all of us today. You can't, in fact, stress has a healthy purpose in our lives. But if we go back to centuries and centuries and centuries before when we were being chased by dinosaurs, that was an, an automatic response to the stress about we were alive or not, you know, are, is our lives at risk? And what happens with that healthy stress is that you get an adrenaline rush and the adrenaline from the adrenal glands actually says we need to either fight, flee or freeze. So as, as in that kind of situation, so imagine today a similar circumstance would be someone running a red light heading towards you, or your child reaching up and grabbing for a hot uh, skillet on the stove, that's an adrenaline rush. That's a healthy stress response. However, when stress lasts chronically, and chronically is typically termed in six to eight weeks or more, where there's a chronic stress event in your life, your adrenaline, your adrenal glands get become exhausted. So adrenaline either spikes and goes down, then cortisol levels go up. And cortisol levels, uh, on, on, when they're prolonged, have an unhealthy response on the brain. And what you see happens there is there will be um, a fear-based response where your brain is actually paralyzed from responding in a healthy way. Your memory lapses. We also find that the studies are showing out of Yale and Berkeley specifically that the, the um, hippocampus in the brain, the, the myelin sheaths then become disorganized and they become coding the neurons. So you're neural circuitry is disactivated by long-term stress. This also puts you at greater risk for chronic disease. 
So we find that your brain becomes frozen. You're not reacting emotionally in a healthy way. You can't think clearly in terms of what your next steps might be. And if you imagine that you're in a work environment, what does that do to your emotional intelligence? What does that do to your ability to think through multiple scenarios and problems that are in front of you? And how does that help you interact with your peers, uh, your colleagues and your supervisors, your bosses, if you will, whether that be your board members, the CEO, or the funders of your company in a way that you can actually gauge their response to your reactions and then and bounce that ball back and forth. So tell me, as you've observed, uh, consulted with companies and worked with CEOs, uh, have you seen this as a, is something that's kind of rampant in our, in our workforce and our, our culture currently? And increasingly so, you know, if you go back in terms of, you know, a decade or so back when we had a rush of charismatic leaders, someone came in with the answer and let's all go this way. So, you you know, we think about Jack Welsh and good to great, if you will. You've got a charismatic, charismatic leader that says we're only going to keep the top performers or we're going to cut the low performers and everyone get on board that bus. That allowed everyone to stop thinking very much. They just did their job. They we strove to be the, the top performers. Today, there are so many options in terms of problem solving and the stress of multiple dilemmas causes many people to freeze. So what we're finding is that the engagement at a problem solving level is not as, is not as robust as used to be, um, that there is more of a tendency to follow the leader, but the leader's not sure what to do. So the, the input from the team is less than dynamic and then the ability to execute becomes hampered because they were fear of doing something wrong. So what I've been talking to CEOs today and particularly in, in talking to um, private equity investors, what they're saying and seeing and observing and experiencing is that a frozen phenomena of real creative thinking at a time where we're, we're, we're experiencing so much exciting disruption. Uh, it seems that the younger workforce comes in with new ideas and they're not as afraid they're not afraid of failures. The, the middle age to older workforce is really stymied by what happens to me in my job if I make the wrong decision. So looking at stress and the, the damage it can cause to us both you know, physically as well as in relationships and in our career, what are some tips that, we, that you could give us to kind of turn that around? Well, you know, before I get to the tips, I'm going to get some motivations because people go, okay, I'm stressed, I'm stressed, and yes, maybe it's damaging my health. It's also causing you to age more rapidly. So what um, the researchers at Berkeley have found is that your telomeres, and telomeres are like the end of your shoelace, that little plastic thing that's on the end of your shoelace, and how long or short it is, Mark, is how quickly or slowly you're aging. Okay? So your chronological age, let's say that you're 45, chronologically, biologically, you could be 62 or 22. Stress is accelerating your aging. And by accelerating your aging, then we see again the impact on memory, decision making, um, as well as chronic disease risk. So what are the motivators to de-stress? They're, they're huge. They're not just your performance in your work, it's the performance in your life, as you mentioned in relationship, financial decision and whatnot. The first and foremost thing is simply to breathe. And people say, well, of course, I'm always breathing. Think about it. If you're breathing shallowly, you're really still in that fear and fight response. So I'm currently working with a company called Behavior, which is a virtual reality company focused on um, uh, fully immersive virtual reality for stress, addiction, and pain management. And Dr. Pete Beaker, who is the C chief medical officer, who is a um, orthopedic oncologist who's gotten his PhD in mindfulness, says if you're, you know, when you're breathing in a slow, deep breath, you put your body in a state of awareness. It's not in that fear and fight thing. At that point, your brain begins to fire differently. The neurons begin to signal differently. So very simply to take three minutes and just breathe or take a second in a meeting and notice as your breath is coming, breath is coming all the way up from your diaphragm and down, that begins to get new signals to your brain. So that's the first thing. Uh, and it sounds as simple as it is, but we, most of us are shallow breathing most of the time. Uh. So that's a simple one. Um, another one that is really helpful is, and I'm going to everyday things, is find the, the people in your environment who make you laugh. Because you cannot be fearful and stressed at the same time that you're healthily laughing. So laughing is a very simple one. But I'm going to go more specifically to meditation. 
And there are a lot of apps today that are out there supporting meditation, but the research on mindfulness and meditation and mindfulness supports that at a cellular level, you are rewiring neural circuitry into healthy patterns, that you can actually create new neurons, new neural pathways at any age. Even if you've damaged or stymied them, you can, you can start to really reignite them. So what does it mean to meditate? I've been uh, meditating for over 20 something years and I have had a deep practice, but I began to look at virtual reality as a tool for meditation just about a year ago. But very simply, there's if you become quiet, short, deep in your breath, and begin to let the thoughts go across your mind, almost like leaves on a stream, they're passing you as you're sitting on the dock. Then you begin to tap into more of your innate emotional intelligence, your brain begins to rewire healthily. And what we talk about are the dysregulated neural circuitry that becomes stymied with stress and under pain and addiction. You begin to regulate that neural circuitry in a much more healthy way. Research shows that six to eight weeks of, of meditation at 20 minutes a day will actually begin to show new neural growth mm -hmm. and promote healthier decision-making and more stamina and resilience. So if someone were to uh, take some of those, uh, those ideas or, or those tips, uh, can, can you make us uh, younger as far as can you reverse? You mentioned reversing some of that as far as, you know, in our minds. Uh, what are the results that uh, people that maybe have started doing these practices on a, on a regular basis? Uh, what, are, what are some of the results? Uh, some of the research has been done in the telomere world with, again, the, how rapidly or slowly you're aging it's focused on women who were caregiving for children with special needs and aging parents. And they found that by, by practicing mindfulness and, and medita uh, discipline meditation practice, they actually slowed the uh, telomere shortening, meaning that in compared to the control group, they were aging less rapidly. So that's a very stressful example if you think of children with special needs and aging parents. Uh, another study was looking at people who were driving and we're listening to podcasts that were more, more intentional in terms of mindful, uplifting, funny, thinking about what could be possible and the imagining of a good future. And this showed that these people were able to, to perform better in the workplace as gauged by their superiors mm -hmm. at a two to three times uh, better rate, 20 to 30 percent better than their peers not. And so that was a significant study as well. Those are two. So technology, uh, it's become something that uh, we're all, it seems like, uh, constantly on technology. How is that impacting as far as our, our stress and what are some, some things that uh, we can do differently? Well, you know, an overuse of technology is showing, that has been shown to actually reduce the gray matter in the frontal lobe. Hmm. So this is where you have your cravings, your emotional control, your resilience. So when we feel that we're never off, and think about it, we all have an addiction, if you will, to some sort, to our phones, to our computers, to our emails, to, you know, to the text messaging we're getting, if you're doing Slack, if you're doing HubSpot, whatever it is. So much coming at so far as there's only so much that your brain can handle. That being said, you know, learning how to put boundaries on that is particularly helpful. Um, many people say that they find that if they turn off their computer and all their smart devices, 15 to 20 minutes before going to bed at night and then really quiet down. It, the recommended is 45 minutes. A lot of people have a hard time with that, but at least 15 to 20 can say, I'm not going to have this next to my bed and be checking it. That is one really powerful strategy because a good night's sleep, again, is one of those things that keeps you, you, keeps you centered and able to respond better during the day. So that's one piece of it. Uh, there are apps out there like Calm is one that I've talked to a physician, uh, actually a neuroscientist in um, California last week that said he starts his day with uh, the Calm app. He does it over lunch and he does it in, at the end of the day. That being said, an app is still two dimensional. It's not fully immersive. And I became fascinated when people were asking me after a very stressful session in my life, um, how did I make it through? And I kept saying, well, it's my meditation. And as, as colleagues of mine, particularly C-suite level friends were saying, I don't have time to meditate. How can I get there more quickly? I, I really researched what was the opportunity in using virtual reality as a medium 
to really bring that to focus, no pun intended, because you do get a fully immersive technology with virtual reality. And Dr. Skip Rizzo out of the University of Southern California has used virtual reality as a tool for PTSD, particularly for military vets, recovering and found that by fully immersing, your brain does not know the difference if you're actually having the event or if you are, if you and I are actually talking today or if it's a simulation by aliens, right? But your brain wires according to that experience. So I found like I actually work with behavior and this is one of the headsets we have there working with stress, addiction and pain management. I actually also use this when I'm highly or in a more agitated state to help me get into my meditative straight, uh, state more quickly. Ah, interesting. So with virtual reality, since it's a, it's a fairly, fairly new, it's been around for a while and gamers have been using it for, for some time, but uh, tell us a little bit about the, the work and kind of the results that, uh, that you're getting from, from right. that. There, virtual reality has been around for over two decades. We've seen 20 plus years of research. There's, uh, as you said, there's gaming. Um, there's gaming and distraction. There are a number of, of companies out there today that are promoting uh, distraction therapy, particularly for patients with pain and also stress management. And distraction therapy basically is that, exactly what it says. You're swimming with the dolphins or you're walking in the field and it takes your mind off the stressful situation you might be in or the stress of chronic pain. And it has a purpose. You are, you are transported into a different room for a short period of time. Uh, what Behavior, the company that I'm really fascinated by and working with today, does is actually the fully immersive, back to Dr. Skip Rizzo's research, a fully immersive experience, multimodality in terms of your senses. So your, you know, your sight, your, your, your audible, uh, your hearing, and we're moving into even, um, Dr. Rizzo has done work even with smells, with the, um, the aromatherapy component of it. But when your brain is fully immersed, and you do this repeatedly, again, six to eight weeks for 20 minutes a day, you begin to rewire the circuitry. So you're regulating dysregulated circuitry, which then impacts your ability to think more clearly, your memory, your decision-making, and also your ability to have more resilience and stress control. So, you know, meditation, many people think of as something that you go off and you sit cross-legged and, you, you know, okay. you own, uh, and that is one way to do it. But there's many ways to really find yourself in that contemplative state of being much more mindful and then bringing that into your everyday living. Mm. And virtual reality is a, t a tool that helps accelerate that. So what is the importance what do you see the importance of you know you talk about meditation but uh having kind of that break from work because work can run into uh you know the, the rest of our life and because of our connectedness uh how important is is it for people to refuel and to have some interests outside of work it's is essential i mean you know we're no we're not one-dimensional people so if you look at the studies, the research shows that people that are healthiest and live longest are those that have faith in a higher power, whatever you might call that your higher power. So this is not a religious specific phenomenon, uh, a social support system. In fact, research shows that um, women who have healthy girlfriends, even if they live multi-states away, are likely to be healthier, fitter, and live longer. Um, the, the opportunity there beyond faith, faith, and friends is also pets. Pets lower cortisol levels. There's an you know that that unconditional love you feel. So finding that piece and then exercise. Dr. Beaker says that particularly when you're meditating, exercise is like the antihistamine that gets you know gets the gets you sort of unclogged. But exercise is like blowing your nose. <laughs> so it's a metaphor that sort of gets people's attention because you're moving things out from the stressful parts of your brain. You're releasing those, those neurotoxins, if you will, allowing positive neuropeptides to come in. And then with you know, exercise, you're actually elevating what's called cytokine 6 and cytokine 10. So you're getting the healthy cytokines moving in your system that actually promote healthier brain function too. Interesting. So having... I'll have to, to share this with my wife. Our, our dog is uh, elderly and he's getting a point and she's saying, well, you know, maybe this is the last dog we'll have. So this is, this is uh, <laughs> some, some good uh, evidence that we need to keep, keep pets around. So uh, yeah, the studies support it. The studies support that, you know, and they don't, and your dogs don't need braces, although we send it and, you know, you don't have to send them to college. Although today the, uh, we, we have knee replacements and all sorts of things. So it's, 
you do have an investment in your pet beyond just the love, but it's sure. worth So looking back at what you've learned uh, over your career, if you were able to go back and uh, talk to a 22-year-old uh, Jeannie, what, what advice would you give her? Stay focused. Stay focused. I mean, you know, when, when I look at my career, the common denominators are the fact that I can take something that's messy and unform whether that's a startup or turnaround and put that together. Staying focused on that has really served me well. So as I look at the common denominators, focusing on those uh, strengths that I have in terms of bringing people together, communicating that message. And if I were to say something to myself in terms of what to do differently, it's remember who the audience is. I had, had 360 done one time by a CFO of a large health system who said to me, you know, you assume that everyone in the room is smart. And that blew me away. And what he said to me is you're going into board meetings and you're starting over here and you've got to back them up as to, you know, what it really, what is, for instance, what does value-based purchasing mean? You've already assumed they've gotten it, they're doing the math, they know where the, the financial risk are. You have to break it down to the lowest common denominator and step up from there. And I wasn't always patient enough to do that. So if I were talking to my 22 year old self, I would say stay focused and be patient and speak more slowly. Okay. So any, any books that you would recommend to an executive that you've read either recently or in the past that you think would be beneficial mm -hmm. to? I just read The Surrender Experiment by Mike Singer, who was one of the, um, sold his company to WebMD. And that was, he, taught, he was one of the first that had the uh, EMR, if you will, uh, electronic medical record for physician practices. Uh, and he, his, his beginnings were around meditation and mindfulness and then following the leads that the universe, for lack of a better word, put in front of him. I found that really has been really helpful. I've shared that with a number of CEOs who have said, oh, I don't do this. And then they look at how many gazillions he sold his company for. I thought, well, maybe there's something to that. So I find that one is an outstanding one for those that might be slightly skeptical of the value of meditation and awareness and mindfulness. Another one that I, I think is really out, outstanding is uh, The Go-Giver. And The Go-Giver talks about each of us has a skill set, whether that's connectivity to others, um, ability to raise others up, and you find your own gifts in bringing that forth, following the magic of your gifts, and connecting those with others. I find those to be really strong. In fact, Blake McWhorter was the CEO of Health Trust Hospitals, one of my original mentors, and he passed two years ago. I had given that, him that book six months before he died, The Go-Giver, and, and upon his death, it was sent out to all, the, all of his company boards, because he had an investment company as well, all his company boards uh, and all the board members as, as part of his legacy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I find that one to be a really powerful one as well. Great. Any parting advice that you would give uh to someone either starting out earlier in their career or, or someone midway through and maybe feel, feel stuck or feel like uh, they're not getting the results that they, they would like? Sure. Um, I think there's no, there's, we underestimate the power of imagination. You know, there are many books out there today, like The Secret, Thoughts Become Things, and you can think of that as like the woo-woo. You can go back to Napoleon Hill, uh, Think and Grow Rich. If you can imagine a future and see yourself in it, the, similar to virtual reality, the more emotion you can put into your visioning, and that's why people do vision boards today, the more emotion you can put into where you want to be, where you're going and what that next baby step is, you imagine the feeling of achieving that, and you do that as part of your mindfulness meditation practice, you will get there sooner. It is, it is a reality. And so when we think of thoughts become things or think, think and grow rich, it's been proven for decades. And it is the power, again, of having your mastermind group, those that think like you, who recognize that the future truly is part of our creation and that we co-create it with whatever you call your higher power and the colleagues that support you. So never forget your imagination, the power of it, and make sure you create space in your day to enliven it. Well, thanks so much. How would somebody learn more about your, your, uh, your practice and your company? And uh, tell us how. Uh, Behavior.com, B-E-H-A-V-R.com. Uh, so the virtual reality for currently for stress, addiction, pain management. We're moving into many other realms of the digital therapeutics, but that would be an exciting place to start. B-E-H-A-V-R.com. Great. 
Well, thanks, Jeannie. This has been a lot of fun. I appreciate your time and your insights. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Mark. Thanks. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Motivated to Lead podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes. You can also see a video version of this interview at motivatedtolead.com. This podcast is brought to you by SEMA Partners, helping you find your next great leader.